Throughout human history, we've had a tendency to fashion weapons to kill and maim each other. Being a warrior has been one of the most important parts of being a king, or an emperor, or whatever, even if they would never set foot on the battlefield. They've had all the ceremonial swords and shiz to represent their status. So we've gathered together some of the most interesting and pointy offerings that the world of swords has to offer. These are the 20 most legendary swords that actually exist. Number 20. Video Game Swords I'm going to begin this list with a little bit of fun, because as noted in the introduction, video games have had all sorts of legendary swords over the years. If you held up a picture of the correct sword, most gamers would be able to recognize it on sight. But what some of you may be surprised at is that there are plenty of video game swords that have been crafted to be wielded by gamers. And no, I'm not talking about cheap plastic or foam, I'm talking about real steel swords that you can buy. For example, there's one sword from World of Warcraft, Frostmourne. World of Warcraft fans will know it as the blade of the legendary Lich King who wielded it to nearly freeze over all of Azeroth. Crap, that's heavy. The sword itself was made as part of a special line of collector's items, so there aren't that many out there. One person who was able to get the sword actually brought it onto Pawn Stars to see if the crew would like to buy it off of him, but no deal was made. A more common place you can get these video game swords are at Comic-Cons. There are typically multiple vendors who love making and selling these items to those who appreciate them, and I can personally attest to getting the Master Sword from The Legend of Zelda from one such event. I've also got the a Hylian shield and an ocarina from the event, which was money well spent. So if you're looking for some gamer swag, you need only to look online and find the sword of your gaming dreams waiting for you, if you're willing to pay for it, that is. Before we go on, like this video, smash the subscribe button, and click the notification bell right now, or this centipede will crawl on your face when you're sleeping. Now it's time for the sweet topic. The Noramitsu Odachi Sword is a giant katana that more people should know about. This Japanese blade is bigger than most humans. At a length of 3.77 meters, this blade is an absolute beast. Forged from steel and weighing more than 14 kilos, we can't imagine anyone wielding it with ease. That's why it's more of a ceremonial and decorative piece crafted in celebration of Japanese gods. Or at least that's one theory for why a sword bigger than a man would be forged. The other theory is that the ancient Japanese people believed in gigantic monsters, hence the propensity of kaiju in fiction. So the sword was made in fear that a creature of Godzilla scale should surface in reality. As always, let us know your thoughts in the comments section down below using the hashtag Sweet Topic. Number 19. Scissor Biak. I now go from the realm of video game history to the realm of actual history with a sword that I absolutely cannot pronounce. There have been many swords wielded by many true life warriors and villains, and one such was this one, whose name I'm not going to try and say again. This legendary sword was rumored to contain a chip that was knocked out when King Bloslas slammed it against the Golden Gate of Kiev as he had laid siege to the city during the 11th century. Even though the sword was said to be completed during the 12th century at the earliest, there is a possibility that it was used to strike a gate during a siege at some point, which was a symbolic action that was performed by militaries at the time. And as we all know, history is full of stories that can't actually be verified, but that doesn't diminish the legend because it can't be fully debunked either. This sword was used as a coronation sword for hundreds of years before it was looted, and eventually it would be returned to Poland. It's hailed as a crown jewel of that time period, and it's not hard to see why. These swords aren't only cool weapons to the people who grew up on the stories, they're also a piece of their history. They're something that's meant to be preserved or used for special occasions like the crowning of a king or a ruler. It's clear to the Polish that this sword was something that had great significance to them, and so it's only 
only fair to them to honor it by putting it on display for others to see and admire. Sadly though, and not surprisingly, the sword also has ties to some, well, darker elements. Mainly the sword is so revered that it's used as a symbol for certain extremist groups. Well, at least it looks cool though. Number 18. Skitshito. Shout out once again to the video game crowd. As you may recall, this particular real-life sword being used in a certain attorney series, but more on that later. This seven-branched sword is a very unique weapon from history that did indeed exist. The twist is that it's a ceremonial sword believed to be a gift from a king to a Yamato ruler. One look at the sword and it's easy to see that it's not like any other sword out there. The branches on the sword make it emphatically unique, though to be clear, this weapon is not one that was used for combat. If you look at the place where the hilt would be to contain the sword, the steel has no place for it. Hence why it was a ceremonial sword, because it's a bit hard to hold. Just as interesting as the look are the inscriptions on the blade. One side reads, the sword was made of 100 times hardened steel, using the sword repels 100 enemy soldiers. Now that's a bold claim and not technically accurate in the hardened steel side of things, but that one will let slide. The other side's inscription partly reads, Never before has there been such a blade. That part is true, and for obvious reasons. To make a blade like this would require not only skill, but a desire to make a very atypical blade. You're going to see some variations on sword design in this video, but none of them compare to this. Remember, a sword is supposed to slash and stab quickly and efficiently, and wielding this blade would be anything but efficient in battle. The belief behind the design is that it is to look like a tree with its many branches, and in a certain Ace Attorney game, they noted that it's representative to life and how life can take many paths, but it always ends up in the same place. Number 17. La Tizona. Now we'll head to Spain. La Tazona was a sword that was carried by Rodrigo Diaz de Vivar, aka El Cid. He was a Castilian knight and warlord in medieval Spain, fighting with both Christians and Muslim armies during his lifetime. He earned the Arabic honorific Al Cid, which would evolve into El Cid, which translates to the Lord, and the Spanish moniker El Campeador meaning the valiant. So clearly the guy was a big deal if he was granted such titles. And after his death, he became Spain's celebrated national hero and the protagonist of the most significant medieval Spanish epic poem, El Cantar de Mio Cid, which presents him as the ideal medieval knight, strong, valiant, loyal, just, and pious. So yeah, he seems like a cool guy. Oh, and he totally has a statue of himself in Burgos, so feel free to visit if you're nearby. The sword does have quite the history with ownership as well. This sword was long owned by the Marquises of Falches and kept in their Marcilla Castle, now in the Museo de Burgo, where, as I just noted, is also the home of El Cid's statue and probably also a place that I mispronounced. Even after it was looted and then recovered, there was some controversy with the sword. Some honestly wonder if the blade is actually the one that he had wielded long ago, and there was some confusion about the construction of the blade and how it went together. Then once all of that was settled, the value of the blade was called into question as well. Regardless of all that, it was a cool sword, and it has a great history, and now it's home in Spain on display. The Lord would be pleased with that, I think. Number 16. Kurtana, the Sword of Mercy. Here's a sword that's much more relevant right now due to recent events. That's because Kurtana, known as the Sword of Mercy, is the ceremonial sword that is used to help coronate kings and queens of Great Britain. You know, the country that just lost a queen not too long ago, and thus this sword was just used to anoint their next leader. Yes, that was pretty recent. Just as important though, the sword's hilt has one of the crown jewels within it, and that means that it's worth a pretty penny, and the royal family will do everything they can to keep it within the family. As for the sword's name, it's very much like the sword itself, one that's shifted over time. The meaning attributed to Kurtana and the other two British coronation swords has shifted over the years. During Henry IV, meanings were assigned to the swords of the coronation ceremony, but initially Kurtana was said to signify the Sword of 
justice. Eventually, however, Cortana's blunt edge was taken to represent mercy, and thus it became known as the Sword of Mercy as it is known today. Cortana's designation of the Sword of Mercy goes at least as far back as Henry IV's coronation. Given that the King or Queen of England is meant to watch over and protect the people, hearing it be called the Sword of Mercy might be viewed as a reminder to those in power to not seek out problems, but to solve them. Something that may be hard with the new monarch. There have actually been multiple swords made called Cortana over the years of the crown, and some of them have been made specifically for the coronations of the rulers. Number 15. Campalon Remember how I told you that certain legends of history cannot be verified, and yet people still use them all the same? Well, the sword known as Campalon is a great example of this, because it has quite a legend that's attached to it, but it can't actually be proven for some basic reasons. According to Filipino history, this sword is believed to be one that struck down the famous explorer Ferdinand Magellan at the hands of the legendary chief Datu, Lapu Lapu. Now, if you forgot, Magellan was the man who sailed around the world, or at least at least he tried to do so. He actually died before the voyage could be completed, but it was completed, so yes, people just associate it with him. However, there's no historical proof of exactly how he died in this particular battle, or even if he went hand-to-hand -hand with the chief. It's not hard to see why the Filipino people would want to talk about this legend. They potentially took out a key person in history, not to mention it was their brave chief who did the deed, which makes them look even more cool. Focusing on the blade itself, the Campalon is quite the cool weapon. It has a unique top point, as there are actually three. The warriors who wielded them made the blades themselves, and were often the first wave of fighters that you would face. The swords were so sharp that they could apparently slice multiple heads off in one. That shows how long that they were, and how strong that they were. It's believed to be the longest traditional sword ever carried by Filipino warriors to date, and it's even the national sword of certain areas of the Philippines. So it's not surprising that they'd want to proclaim the greatness of this sword however they could. Number 14. Wallace Sword now, I've mentioned quite a few times that certain heroes have wielded swords, and William Wallace definitely fits that mold. The legendary freedom fighter from Scotland who fought for freedom. The sword that he wielded was technically a claymore, one that was well over five feet in length. Just the blade is over four feet, and they can sometimes be longer than that. But why would a warrior want to wield such a long two-handed weapon? Well, to slice off heads, of course. When you're fighting for your freedom, you need to make sure that you can kill the people who are trying to kill keep you from your freedom. The sword that's been dubbed the Wallace Sword is believed to have been used by the warrior during the Battle of Stirling Bridge in 1297 and the Battle of Falkirk in 1298. The sword is currently on display in the National Wallace Monument in Stirling, Scotland. However, while there's little doubt that William Wallace used a sword like this in battle, it's hard to say for certain that it was the one that he himself used that's on display. When looking at the sword more closely, it appears that it is a mismatch of parts from different times and sword-making styles, thus making it difficult to determine whether the Scot ever actually used it, or if someone made it to look like one that he might have used and then passed it off as the real thing. Sadly, that kind of thing is popular in the antiquities market. It. But either way, we do know that Wallace existed and that his fight for freedom is honored to this day. Number 13. Napoleon's Sword now here's another historical figure who had a famous sword, and this one we can more easily identify. The beautifully decorated sword that you're seeing was carried by Napoleon Bonaparte at the Battle of Austerlitz on the 2nd of December, 1805. In this decisive victory, the French forces annihilated a combined Austrian and Russian force sent to destroy the upstart Bonaparte. That was but one of many victories that the future ruler would achieve. In fact, that battle was one that kickstarted his conquest of Europe. Only Britain was able to oppose him, and they took their sweet time trying to deep 
oppose him. The sword was made for Napoleon at the end of the consulate period by the famous goldsmith Martin Guillaume Bienes of Paris. Napoleon always referred to it as my sword, and although he owned many, it is the one that is most associated with him. But here's the twist though. While it was Napoleon's sword, it was more of a status symbol than anything else. Adorned with gold, it also featured a portrait of Napoleon on the handle, and there was much more embellishments. Yes, it was sharpened so that it could attack someone if he actually needed to, but it was not actually designed for combat. Well then, what was it for? As I said, a status symbol, that symbol being that he was the supreme commander of the army. When people saw him with the sword, they knew that they were talking to the head man. It's just a pity that his campaign ended up short. Number 12. The Yurumi I'm going to step away from legendary warriors and focus instead on unique weaponry for this next one. Like with the seven-branched sword from before, there have been some cultures that are fascinated with turning swords into something unfamiliar and new. This one is one such sword, but if you look at it, it doesn't look like a sword at all now, does it? Instead, it looks more like a robust whip weapon. Both are true, though. This soft blade weapon was used by the people of India during the Sangam period of history. The blades could be absolutely painful for the record, but the technique needed to use them was also important. A typical sword is a weapon that you slash or thrust with, depending on the size of the blade. However, with this sword, you would use it more like a flare or a whip. You'd use your momentum and positioning to strike the foe with the mini-bladed weapon. The Yurumi is always taught last in Indian martial arts, further showing you that this weapon is not to be used prematurely. The blade is fashioned from flexible edge steel that measures three quarters to one inch in width, and ideally that length of blade should be the same as the wielder's arm span, which is usually four feet to five and a half. Some wielders of the weapon could actually handle one in each hand. Just imagine facing them on the battlefield as they danced around you and hit you from basically all sides with this blade. It is a very scary thought. Number 11. The Ulfbert Swords Picture a sword. You know, any sword from history. Do you have it? Well, good. Now, how much time and effort do you think was put into making that sword? The reason I ask is because history buffs will sometimes downplay the cost of arming an army. It takes money to make weapons, and if a weapon breaks, then you need another one, right? Wars are costly, both then and now, but just like now, there are levels to the craftsmanship of a weapon that you can get. In the days of the Vikings, the best blades around were the Ulfbert swords. These swords were so awesome that even to this day, I'm not exactly sure sure how they were made or why they were so good. These swords were said to have been sharper, stronger, and more flexible than anyone else's. When you're a Viking and trying to raid on a constant basis, having such a sword is a must. Carbon was said to be the secret ingredient to making the blade so powerful. Considering that they did this well before the Industrial Revolution, it was quite the feat to get it done so perfectly. Less than 200 of these swords are known about in the modern day, so if you do see one, pay some respect to the legends that created them, because they built them strong and made sure that they could last in the heat of battle. Number 10. Kopesh Throughout history, various cultures have modified the weapons that they've used to better suit their style of warfare or to overcome the strategies of other nations. That's why there is such a variety of swords out there. Long ones, short ones, curved ones, dual-edged, and many more. But one of the more unique designs of swords that has ever come from the Egyptians via the Kopesh. These swords were actually born from the concept of the battle axe, but they had a dual purpose as well. The interior curve could do one of two things in the right warrior's hands. It could either trap the arm and ensure the foe couldn't attack, or it could grab an enemy's shield and rip it away. Then they would simply spin the blade around and strike with the sharp end. It's a clever trick, and one that has helped them for many years. Number 9. Sword of Gujin 
Here's another sword that turned people's heads when it came back to light in the modern day. The Sword of Gujin, which I probably mispronounced, thank you, may not seem that odd from a distance, but when you get up close, you're going to notice several details that makes it stand out from the rest. The first thing you may notice is the intricate details on the blade itself. Swords are known for inscriptions, but that's another level of detail. The second thing you'll notice is that despite it being very old, the blade does show no signs of tarnish. It's almost as if it's immune to it. That kind of preservation is rare in swords and other weaponry. In 1965, the sword was found in an ancient tomb and is currently in the possession of a provincial museum. You'll have to go there to see it, because after a worker damaged it while on tour, China decreed that it would never go out of the country again. Number 8. Roman Gladius Now, let's go to another culture and show you how they dominated the world thanks to their blade. The Roman legions are famous for their combat prowess and their ability to work in great numbers to overcome most odds. Their tried and true blade to use was the Roman Gladius. What may surprise you, though, is that the Gladius is not that long of a weapon compared to what you've seen so far. Rather, it's rather tiny in comparison. They were typically only about 18 inches long and about 2 inches wide, and while they weren't the most powerful of weapons, that didn't matter at the time. They could easily pierce and slash through armor, armor that paled in comparison to what the Romans had during their peak. Plus, because of the large shields that they would carry from the Gladius. Number 7. Kusanagi no Tsurugi Not to be confused with the sword from Naruto, this sword is one of the most legendary blades in all of Japan. So much so that the story behind the blade has been transformed into legends over the years. A legend goes that the warrior Susanoo, also not to be confused with the entity from the cartoon, was asked by a grieving family to beat the snake beast known as Yamada no Orochi. After being promised the final daughter's hand in marriage, he tricked the snake into eating a bunch of rice, one tub of it for each of the snake's heads. After cutting the heads and tails off, he then found a sword within the body that he gave to the sun god, who would later give it to another warrior for protection. The sword does still exist today, but it's kept safe due to its divine status. Number 6. Miramasa Sword Here's one of the other legendary swords from Japanese history, though, to be clear, the swords were not called Muramasa swords per se. Rather, Muramasa was a legendary swordsmith who made all manner of katana for the shoguns and other warriors of Japan. And he even made his own school by which these swords were created. The Muramasa sword was a piece that was so splendid that it was a piece of artwork by Japan. His swords were so great that his legend far exceeded his weaponry. Case in point, in Marvel Comics, Wolverine got multiple swords from Muramasa himself. They were so powerful that they could only kill just about everything, which included supernatural entities and demons, and they also could not be broken. Obviously, that's not the case with the actual swords, but it goes to show you how much people revered the work of this man. Number 5. Joy Use how about a sword used by a famous king? The Joyeuse was a sword that was said to have been used by the great leader Charlemagne as his personal weapon. You may recall that Charlemagne had many titles over the years, which included King of the Franks and a Roman Emperor for a time. He united Europe under his banner and cemented himself in history as a result. Fast forward to now, and a sword identified as Joyeuse was used in French royal coronation ceremonies since the 13th century, and it's now kept at the Louvre Museum. Whether it's real or not is debated, and some have even said that it's a modern replica. But either way, the importance of the sword and the man behind it is not in dispute. Number 4. Excalibur now, if we're just naming swords that were legendary, we would have to put Excalibur at the top. The problem is that, much like King Arthur, we don't know if it actually existed. Excalibur was the legendary sword in the stone, the one that was used by Arthur, to become king and defend Camelot along with other lands. The reason that Excalibur is so famous was because only the one true king was said to be able to pull this sword from the stone, thus cementing Arthur as not only a hero, but also a worthy lord. 
In modern times, there have been discoveries that claim to be the legendary sword. One such blade was even a gift from King Richard I to an ally, but whether the sword actually exists depends on who you talk to. Number 3. Sword of Osman Jumping back into proven history, we now have a look at the Sword of Osman. This was another ceremonial sword that was used to crown the rulers of the Ottoman Empire. The sword would be named after Osman I, founder of the Ottoman dynasty, and the practice began when Osman I was gifted the Sword of Islam by his mentor and father-in-law. The fact that the emblem by which a sultan was enthroned consisted of a sword that was highly symbolic, it showed that the office with which he was invested was first and foremost that of a warrior. And the Ottomans did go to war quite a bit, so the man who got the job knew right away that his true duty was to his people, to fight for them and with them in combat. Number 2. Tomoyuki Yamashita Sword this is a sword that Japan probably isn't the most proud of. That's because the sword is also a symbol, but one of surrender. In September of 1945, Tiger of Malaya, General Tomoyuki Yamashita of the Imperial Japan Army, surrendered his forces in the presence of British Lieutenant General Arthur Percival and other senior officers in the Philippines by handing over his samurai sword to the victorious allies. The gesture was well received and invoked the honor warrior nature of the Japanese people, because to give away one sword is a very symbolic gesture indeed. And since then, it's been part of multiple museums in tribute to World War II, which has included ones in the United States and Singapore. Number 1. Zulfikar What's more significant than a hero's weapon, a royal piece of history, or a legendary piece? Well, how about a religious artifact? Zulfikar is a sword that was passed down to Ali ibn Abi Talib by the Prophet Muhammad himself, the father of Islam if you didn't know. Nicknamed by some as the Spine Splitter, the Zulfikar was apparently gifted to Ali because of his ability to destroy the armor of even the mightiest of combatants from the Mecca region. Muhammad himself was impressed by his ability and replaced a broken sword that he had with this one. There are some who do say the sword still exists today in the hands of the hidden being that will eventually save mankind. That's all from the realm of legendary swords that you can get or see for yourself. Which of these epic blades do you feel is the best of the lot? And which ones would you personally want to wield in battle or pose with to feel awesome? Do you know of any other swords that could be on this list? Be sure to let me know all about it in the comments section down below. Check out the other cool things that are showing up on the screen, and I'll see you next time.